is the Big O Show. This is the Big O Show. The like button, it is so important. We got over 500 people watching right now. Please smash the hell out of the like button. It is incredibly important that you do that. There's the man, the myth, the legend that is Alan Pupar. Alan, thank you, sir, for joining us. How painful was that? That was uh, that was uh, pretty tough to watch, my brother. Yeesh. E easy, easy, uh, easy one to write for you too, by the way. Yeah, there was not, not a whole lot of rewriting at deadline, that's for sure. You know what no. the most frustrating part of the game was? What's that? Is as bad as it started, they had so many chances in the first half to get right back in the game, and it was just one mistake after another to keep him from doing it. And, man, it, it was like 14 nothing at the half. And, and it's they like, shut, maybe they should have been down. down. I mean, the defense shut him down after those 14 points yeah. for that, that entire half. They actually played their asses off. And you are so correct, man. The the Dolphins had every chance to go in at halftime with a tied game, mm -hmm. uh, and and at least feel better about wow, you lost your quarterback, but yet you're still in the game. And it had to have been deflating for the defense going into the second half that there isn't a lot of hope on offense. No, no question. And then the Bills drove down the field at, at the start of the second half, and it's like okay, ball game, that's over. And uh, I know you didn't ask me about this, but I know the offensive line is going to get killed, and rightfully so. But can we talk about how bad the wide receiver core was in this game? I mean, yikes. Yes, yes. They were terrible. Uh, obviously, the O-line is the obvious one that they were absolutely – I'm sure Jesse Davis feels like crap right now because he allowed Tua to get absolutely squashed uh, in, the, in that hit. And uh, it was rough to watch, but the wide receivers really let this team down today. Devontae Parker cannot drop that touchdown. I mean, that's just unacceptable. Albert Wilson makes the drop. They use my I – don't, I don't understand this. If you have all these didn't, – didn't we talk about this? Now that you have all these receivers, you don't have to use Jakeem at wide receiver. Yet they use them at wide receiver, and then you got the fumble. I didn't understand that. I – I love Jakeem as a returner, but don't use him as a wide receiver. And then they went to it again, and then there you go. Look what happens when you go to the well once again. No, I didn't like that either. I also don't understand why they're not using Mac Collins a little bit more at wide receiver based on what I, what my eyes showed me during training camp and also – Yes. You know, the, the guy can play wide receiver, and right now he's a much better wide receiver than Jakeem Grant. I don't think that's even in question. Um and right now, we, talk, we can talk about the depth they have at wide receiver all we want, but the only one who's performing really, really well, you know, on a consistent basis is Jalen Waddle. And even he had a rough day today with a couple of drops, including the muff punt. And then Preston Williams was great to see him back in action. But, I mean, he doesn't look, he yeah, doesn't look like a Preston Williams like, like that we saw at his best. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's definitely not himself, but that, uh, it was just nice to get him back, and then now you get him acclimated and you get him going uh, a little bit there. Albert Wilson, if Will Fuller, you know, uh, let's hope that his personal issue is able to be resolved next week. Um, you start looking, do you go Kirk Merritt off the practice squad or do you go Will Fuller? And then does Albert does this cost Albert Wilson a spot? Because, you know, he, he had uh, a couple of drops in this game. And so I know that, you know, we're supposed to count on all the wide receivers, but here's a guy that's had an opportunity the last two weeks to shine in it, and it just hasn't happened for him, man. No, no question. And, yeah, I mean, how long are they going to be carrying seven wide receivers once once, and if Will Fuller comes back? Uh, that, that, that's, a, that's an awful lot. And then again, and right now they're carrying five D linemen because Rick Juan Davis is on IR. That's a very low number. Uh, not to say that the defensive line was – a major part of the problem today. I mean, there were some some issues, particularly on that first run where, where both John Jenkins and Christian Wilkins were completely blown off their spot for that big hole up the middle. And no, and get this, you do realize the first there was a first running play of the game for Buffalo, just like the first running play of the game for New England was a 35 yard run. Yes. I mean, what is I, it about those those first first plays? I mean, it's crazy. What do they see? I mean, because now, I'm sure the Raiders are looking at that, going, "Okay, well, now we we got something to we got something to uh, to take advantage of," and that was also disappointing too. Okay, 
I'm not shocked that the O line struggled. You know what I mean? That's not something. I, but I was shocked at the defense after. You, you know what what you're doing in this game. You know how important it is, and to just allow them to drive up and down the field so quickly and get those 14 points. That was really disappointing. Now, to their credit, they did bounce back and said, all right, offense, it's now on you. And unfortunately, Brissett could not get it done. Um, overall, any changes you would make defensively? No, because I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't have a major issue with the defense. Yes, it was disappointing to give up touchdowns on the first two drives. But you're playing a pretty good team on the other side, even though they don't look to me like the 2020 Bills. Um, but it's still a very good team with a lot of good players. Obviously, the 46-yard touchdown run is inexcusable, but they're going to make plays in the passing game. That's just – I mean, that's a great wide receiver core there that you have with Stephon Diggs, Emmanuel Sanders. Cole Beasley is a very good slot receiver. So I didn't have a major issue with the defense that would call for changes in the least. To me, that loss was 99.7% on the offense with most of that on the offensive line with a little bit on the wide receiver core. The, you know, and jo and let me tell you, Josh Allen wasn't accurate. He missed he missed several passes in this game. He wasn't really sharp. They were just so much better as a team today. And obviously Miami did make, co committed every mistake possible to give them the opportunity. Now let me ask you something. With Brissett, is there any chance that if Tua does not come back this week, do you try to put a little some sum, sum in the competition with uh with Sinet? Because I, I, I can't see I can't see Flo going to the young guy, but I gotta tell you, I kind of like the young guy more for this offensive line than I do Brissett. I think Brissett is more of a, a statue where this kid has some mobility and showed me a little something. Now I know it's preseason compared to the regular season, so it'll be two different things. So does Sinet come in any mix whatsoever here? I would say somewhere between zero chance and 1%. If you're asking me, is it going to happen? Uh, yo, here's the other thing, too. If we're going to be honest, didn't matter who was playing quarterback today. I mean, Lamar Jackson might might have had maybe a shot Yeah, because of his speed. And I say maybe because, yes. Yes. I mean, those guys were on the quarterback like so fast. I mean, Brissett didn't have a chance. Tua didn't have a chance. Yeah. Um, so it didn't matter. And if they're going to play like that against Oakland, which, by the way, has a much better pass rush than they've had in the past, if the offensive line doesn't figure it out, it's going to be another long afternoon for the offense, and it doesn't matter who plays quarterback. But no, Reese that's kind of not going to play quarterback. Yeah, yeah, I, I would imagine that. Eichenberg, is he the starter next week, you think, from here on out at right tackle? Depends on – I mean, you know Jesse left the game with a knee injury, so it depends oh. on that. And, this, and again, this is a guy who was talking about he's having knee swelling management in training camp, so I don't know if what happened today has anything to do with that. Um, who knows when we'll find out his availability for the game on Sunday. If we're talking by performance alone, I know that's a popular thing to do because Eichenberg's the shiny new toy, the rookie second-round pick. But if we're going to single out Jesse Davis for, for poor performance today on the offensive line, I think that's a, that's a little bit unfair because I, I, I noticed specifically, remember you and I have had this talk where my point is always you notice the offensive line only if they do the spectacular pancake block or if they have negative plays. Well, I noticed practically everybody today on that offensive line, and there were no pancake blocks. So Robert Hunt got called for two penalties. Solomon Kindley got completely shoved back on the fourth down run that came up short when Malcolm Brown, they, they ran the RPO. Uh, Eichenberg got beat for a sack. Uh, Austin Jackson got beat for a sack. Let me take that back on Eichenberg. I didn't notice anything. But Austin Jackson got beat for a sack or a QB hit. So it was bad all the way around. I know they won't tell us, and they'll never admit to this, but do you think deep down inside they have some regrets that they're trying to develop too many young offensive linemen at once? Because, you, dude, you and I have been covering this league for a long time combined. We probably have over 60 years of covering this league. Uh, I've never seen four or five young linemen being developed. Maybe two, you know, with a bunch of experienced guys mixed in. Three is really rare to find. Four is craziness. And if uh, this guy doesn't play next week, now you're talking about five. I, I, I think they have to regret a little bit and look at that as a flaw in the plan. Potentially, I think my biggest concern from where I sit is I'm not 
sold on any of them. I mean, Robert Hunt's the one who I've, I've always touted as the one having the highest ceiling, but he hasn't blown me away in the first two games. And today he had, he had the two penalties. Uh, I didn't notice anything flagrant in terms of pass protection, but I, I'm sure he had played a part in it if we were to break down the film. So I, I'm not convinced that any of the guys they got, and Austin Jackson, I'm, I mean, he's, he's a good story. He tries hard. He's a good kid and all that, but he's, he hasn't impressed at no, all. He hasn't impressed, uh, even though it's certainly early. So Salman Kinley is kind of up and down. He's not, he's, he's not great. So that's my biggest concern. is isn't so much that they have a lot of young guys there. Is I just don't know that they have great guys there. Yeah, no, I'm with you. And you know these guys aren't patient. So I'm wondering if Robert Jones now starts to get an opportunity here because that's another young guy that they like and they kept him. And if maybe they want a little more toughness in the interior, especially for running the ball, uh, they kind of feel that he might be a little bit better of a road grader overall because Kinley is considered better as a pass, a pass protector than, than a road grader, right? So could Robert Jones get into the mix this week? Well, yeah, it doesn't make sense, the, the thing on Kinley, though, because you look at his body type, and his body type says road grader. It doesn't say pass protector. Right. Um, and with his body type, if he's not pushing people away from the line of scrimmage, we got a problem. And like I said, on that fourth down play, the Bills' DT, I think it was Justin Zimmer, got major penetration and really killed the play, and that just can't happen. Robert Jones, absolutely, I could would not shock me if there was some change, if there were some changes up front. Like that, they would maybe change a right tackle necessitated by an injury. I, I have a hard time again, and I, I know people on social media were bashing him because he's an easy target. But to me, if Jesse Davis is healthy, I think he has to be somewhere in that starting five. Yeah, no, if he's healthy, but he's not yeah. healthy. See, th this is the problem I have with Jesse Davis. I love Jesse Davis as a six man. But if you're going to be a starter and he hasn't been healthy so far, he hasn't been healthy throughout training camp, he's not good enough to overcome an injury and play at his best. If he's going to play at his best, he needs to be healthy. So get him healthy and might as well throw another young guy in there and let Eichenberg learn at this point in time. That's my only problem is that I just don't think Jesse is talented enough to overcome injuries like some of the elite players in this league at any position. Those elite players, those excellent players, usually even if they're banged up, they find a way to still be somewhat productive. I don't think Jesse's that guy. No, that's fair. I'll throw out another scenario for you, and I'm not just saying that's going to happen. I'm saying that, that maybe would make sense. Get Eichenberg in there at right tackle. This is assuming Jesse's healthy. Get Eichenberg in there at right tackle and move Jesse to like left guard. Okay. And then, okay. Because he's got experience at guard. And right. maybe the, his lack of, of athleticism where he can get beat with a speed move, which is what happened on the play where Tua got hurt, you kind of like alleviate that a little bit by putting him inside. Now, uh, I, I wanted to kind of walk some people off the ledge here. Uh, the offensive line for Miami has 14 years of experience, and that's adding that all these these four guys now are adding their second year, and it just started. You look over to the Bills – and by the way, Jesse Davis has five of those 14 years. Mm. You look over to the Bills, they have 29 years of experience. And that's where you kind of got to check yourself before you wreck yourself a little bit. I get it. They look bad. But the problem is most young linemen can make mistakes, but they also have the luxury of being next to a veteran that helps them out a little bit and makes them look better. This is one young guy next to another young guy next to another young guy next to another young guy. And that just becomes really, really difficult because they're all learning and they have nobody to turn to right now. And that's where I think we've got to – I get it. I, I know that they've been disappointing, but I'm not ready to give up on these guys and say, okay, none of them are going to make it. No, but I think it's fair to be concerned about the offensive line having the ability to wreck what could be a good season because they do have a very good defense um, – even though there's, I mean, there's been there's been some leaks that have sprung in the first two weeks. It is overall a very good defense with a great secondary, and it's definitely clearly a playoff caliber defense. And right now, the offense isn't even close to that. And the biggest reason is the offensive line. So, I, I get the concern. No, it's too early to say it's a washout. Forget it. Start thinking about 2022. 
but very hard, very hard for me to sit here and tell anybody you have no, 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 nothing to worry about. Have you, uh, have you checked out if Lee Steinberg has already said what's wrong with Tua? Because I'm counting on Lee Steinberg to open his mouth and kind of tell us here, uh, because you know, the dolphins are going to tell us day to day and all this good stuff. Uh, have you heard anything? Do you know anything? What do we know? What we know is Tom Pelissero from an NFL network who's very plugged in uh, said or tweeted, I should say, that x-rays on the ribs were negative. You'll have an MRI tomorrow to uh, see exactly what's going on. And then Brian Flores in his after the game press conference said there'll be more tests run. So that's where it stands right now. And, and he also let it slip a little bit like, you know, I'm hopeful that we could get to a back next week in a way, which – that was kind of when he when he let that go. I was like, "Whoa!" Uh, I'm a, I was a little surprised that he kind of threw that out there. Normally, he's so cautious about everything that he says. When he said that, I kind of felt a little hopeful that maybe Tua can come back next week. And you know, listen. In the end, this I know that you you are you have way more concerns about Tua than I do. My main concern has always been durability with him. That's always been my problem with him. I, I think he can play in this league. I'm convinced he has the talent to play in this league. He just needs the experience and the maturation process to all of this overall. But is is that the you know is that one of the things you're concerned about is durability now with this rearing its ugly head in his 11th game? Well, no question. And uh, let's face it, he's just not very big. And, and for the record, I I think he can. I know he can play in this league. I've never my my concern is whether he can become elite. And I'm not. I haven't seen the signs yet. I'm not. I'm not on that bandwagon yet. And right. and yeah, it, durability is always going to be an issue. And this goes beyond just the fact that the injury history he carries with him from Alabama. He's just not big. Right. And, and then you saw the hit that he took. Ooh. It's a good. Well, but it's a good shot. I mean, he landed on him, bro. He just. Right. He, well, he no, he didn't put his. He didn't put his weight on him. He kind of like hit him with the side and like. I hate to do that comparison because the other guy's an outlier in the other direction, but Ren, Ben Roethlisberger takes that hit and he gets up and probably smiles at the guy saying, that's all you got. Right. But, and right. obviously there's a big spectrum, but two is at one end of the spectrum where those kinds of hit are a lot more dangerous for him than they would be for a bigger quarterback. So there's no question durability will always be a concern with him. How concerned are you that this, uh, that this rolls over into other games, this kind of play? Are we talking about from a health standpoint? No, no, no. I'm talking about the team overall. The correct. Oh, like today well, was today was a shit day. So how much do you expect this to roll over into next week? Because you know, if you if you listen to the Twitter world and uh, a lot of the Dolphins, they're 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 they they think it's the end of the world now. That's it. The team is done. And and just to kind of throw this out there, uh, they were zero and two last year, and they went ten and four after that. In year one, they went 0-7 and, and lost by a combined score of 238 and 77 and then bounced back to go 5-4. and four. You know, his teams have been resilient. Correct. How resilient do you expect them to be after this game? Well, the, the biggest source of comfort is the track record with Brian Flores. If I'm looking uh, in a microscope, under a microscope with this 2021 Dolphins team, if we're being honest with ourselves, they probably should be 0-2. And... and they have not looked particularly impressive. And if you were to like gauge them right now as a team to suggest this is a team that absolutely is going to be in the playoffs, I don't think anybody would, would buy that. So yeah, there's absolutely cause for concern. And then you're looking at three straight games coming up that are kind of tricky because Vegas, as we mentioned, is pretty good this year. Then they got Indy at home and I understand Indy's 0-2, but Indy's not, a, not an easy game. And then they got at, at Tampa Bay, which obviously we don't need to mention. So, yeah, no, there's concern that the level of play of this team is going to have to pick up dramatically and pretty soon for this season not to go south very quickly. Follow him on Twitter at Poopart NFL. And, of course, catch his work there at, the, at Sports Illustrated. And if you're a Dolphins fan, his work is exceptional. But I love how Sports Illustrated has it set up on his page where all his stories are in one place. So if you bookmark it, all you got to do is visit it every day, and you're going to see all kinds of great content because Alan, I think, is pumping out on average six to seven articles a day. Uh, I, I don't know. Are you in a competition with Manny Navarro? I'm just I'm just wondering because between, no. you, between you and Manny and, and Barry Jackson, all three of you 
can do an entire newspaper, uh, not not just sports, local entertainment, everything. I mean, you guys are monsters, bro. You're amazing. We're trying. Well, thanks for the kind words. We're trying. No, there's there's a lot of stuff to write to write about, especially during the season. So ho hopefully pretty soon it'll be, you know, nicer things to write about than dissecting an ugly loss like this. Yeah, I'm with you there, my brother. Hey, thank you for taking time. As always, Alan, uh, hang in there, my man. Hopefully it'll get better this week and it'll be a lot easier for you to cover. Yep. It can't get much worse than today, that's for sure. You got it. There you go. The great Alan Poopart, baby. Follow him on Twitter at Poopart NFL. It is the Sports Grill Miami Dolphins Insider Report.